Hey guys, how are you? Adam and Carl here. Happy Friday. Today's an awesome little session, open Q&A uh, per usual on Friday. Today is start your summer of deal making. So we're going to talk about that a little bit here in the beginning. Uh, and we're excited to have you guys. So uh, as always, whenever you join us, just drop drop a comment in the chat, say hi, we look forward to it. Uh, and just, just enjoy these interactions. So Carl, how are you, sir? Ready for the weekend? I'm good. Yeah. Uh, this is like the eighth time I've spoken to you today. So uh, we're cranking on some pretty amazing deals, actually. We can't go into detail, but uh, I'm pretty excited ahead of the weekend with, with the last deal that we've just been talking about, which uh, is going to be awesome. Um, so, um, so yeah, it's been another, another busy week uh, across all the portfolio. And uh, yeah, looking forward to... Uh, getting some time in this weekend. How about you? Yeah, this weekend's going to be great. Uh, headed out of town for the weekend. Uh, so oh, looking forward to that. Uh, hopefully get a little sun and, and stuff. Uh, going back to the back to the eastern shore picking. No, crabs. no, no, not doing that. Uh, going to head out to a lake uh, for the weekend. Uh, hang out. Um, socially distanced, of course. Um, but no, guys, uh, obviously, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now. And, and we just hope everyone out there is doing well. Our thoughts are with all of you guys. Um, and, and we certainly, uh, we certainly stand uh, with many of you. And so we're looking forward to continuing to serve you guys as best we can through all of this. Uh, so, so get your questions in and we're happy to answer them. Uh, but really, Carl, today is about starting your summer of deal making. What, what does deal making look like in the summer and what can you do, not do? And then within the context of everything that's going on, we've got Corona still a thing. And, and, and obviously the financial markets are, aren't exactly where they were, but you know, some things are opening up. You know, we've talked in, in prior weeks around uh, like C bills in the UK and the opportunity that represents. And so there's I think there's just a lot of stuff happening uh, out there that that in, is going to impact this summer. Uh, but I'm excited. I think deal making's an absolute great uh, a great pursuit this summer, without a doubt. It is. It is. And ordinarily, ordinarily, I would say, just from my decades of doing this, ordinarily, July and August are pretty quiet months when it comes to deal making because everyone goes off on vacation and takes time out, enjoys the weather. But this year is going to be very, very different. This year, no one's going anywhere. Um, you know, I, I, I think the weather we've had in the US, we, the weather we've had in the UK, people have already taken some time off. I think July and August are going to be one of the busiest summers for deal making, probably in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, I think everyone's still going to be at home. Um, and with all the things we've talked about before with um, you know, whether or not they have good businesses or not, I, I think the current scenario is going to drive a lot of sellers to the table. Uh, I think they'll want to sweeten the deals uh, that they're prepared to give to buyers uh, just to get out and, and go off and do something else. So, uh, no, I agree with you. I, I think, you know, now is uh, now is the time and, and we're seeing some great stimulus, aren't we? We uh, we, we, we've seen all the stuff happening in the UK with uh, with the C bills um, on this new multi-billion pound funding stream that we can tap into, you know, to buy businesses. Um, and you know, I've been looking at some deals in the UK literally this week. Uh, deals that we looked at, um, you know, within the last twelve months, we were maybe two, three, four hundred grand shy of of a closing payment that wanted the seller to, to, to get the deal done. And now with all this new super cool funding that we can get, we can go and close a bunch of those deals. So uh, I think it's going to be a, a busy summer for us. Um, and, you know, if we pull off the last deal that we've just been talking about, we're going to have a very busy summer, but a very good summer. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and it, it's exciting, right? Uh, like you said, especially August always feels slow. People are getting in those vacations before kids normally go back to school and and we don't even know what august will look like this year uh but overall right things are just different 2020 is the year of unexpected changes right and, and some expected to to be sure uh, everything comes in cycles and and we've seen we've seen instability before we've seen uh in the financial markets i should say and, and I, I think there's there's key elements to understand how that impacts ask prices and things like that 
all that said, you know, realize this is still ultimately a buyer's market. This is still a place where you can negotiate deals. You know, broker deals, deals that are publicly listed are only getting more and more competitive where we're seeing a dearth of competition is for people who are, who are working with off-market deals. So glad you guys are here. Just uh, shouting out some of you guys, Jay, Jacques, uh, Robert, David, good to see you guys. Faith, as always, love to have you. Jeremy, John, uh, Andy, so good to uh, so good to have you guys with us. Uh, you know, we get really pumped for this. We get really excited for this. Uh, something Carl and I are talking about is how do we streamline our live sessions? We've got Mindset Mondays. Uh, we've got Friday here on YouTube with open Q&A. Uh, so what we're thinking about doing is consolidating these and doing a Q&A tied to Mindset Mondays. So expect to hear more from us uh, in the coming weeks and as we try to, to figure out what, what's going to make the most sense so we can continue to serve you guys as best we can. We love Mindset Mondays. We love being able to frankly, put a boot up your rear and, and put a charge in your step for the week and, uh, and really crank things out. Uh, but in the meantime, right, like uh, we also want to make sure we've got an opportunity to be available to you guys to answer questions. That's something that's just super important uh, to us. And so we look forward to continuing to doing that. Um, so, so glad you guys are here. We've got Guy here uh, on someone else's account, Geraldine, actually. Okay. Uh, William's here. Daring Drew's here and Mark's here. So guys, Love to have you here. Uh, always thrilled when you guys are here. So uh, we're really so excited. Really cool, really cool comment from David McLaughlin. He said, hey, Carl's got a Tony Robbins hat on. So, so what's really interesting, so this company, um, it's called Black Clover. This is one of the 57 companies that Tony Robbins is a shareholder of. But I'm going to get you my real Tony Robbins hat. Let me put that on. It's literally right next to me. You'll like this. So... Not many people get to have one of these. So this is my, this is my Tony Robbins Platinum Partnership um, baseball cap. So uh, you gotta, you, you gotta be a plat partner with Tony to have a hat like this. So um, yeah. that's an investment, Carl. Not everyone's, not everyone's either willing or able to make. It, it's, it's interesting though, because um, I only discovered Tony about three years ago. And obviously I've been a deal maker for a long, long time. And what I would say is once I really got into Tony's methodology around mindset and around peak performance and around taking action, uh, I would say it's turned me into a much better deal maker. Um, so not all the years of deals and all the years of Wall Street and all the years of crunching numbers where I've really fine tuned my game and really kind of leveled up is when I really understood mindset not just from my side as a deal maker taking action and as you quite rightly put it Adam kicking ass and taking names but as well it's really helped me understand a lot more kind of where the seller's coming from and the seller's mindsets and and you know I always ask the question when I meet a seller what does the seller have to believe to sell me this business how does that work what's their mindset what's their mental state to get this done so uh and this is why we do mindset monday all the stuff we're learning in you know that the 85 90 000 a year i have to invest to, to play with tony robbins i'm trying to feed that back to you guys through the programs through these lives when we do mindset monday a lot of these things we talk about these are concepts that tony has taught me personally uh i've deployed them on my deals and got great results um, and we want to give back and we want to share all that, um, that with you. So, um, anyway, I'll put my other hat on now because this one's a bit cooler, I think. Uh, well, we if, you, if you're going to pick hats based on coolness, Carl, then, uh, then I guess that's also a mindset thing, right? Uh, charge, charge forth with the, the coolest hat you can possibly wear. Uh, well, hey guys, glad to have you here. Uh, if you've got questions, uh, definitely drop drop them in, in the uh, in the chat here. We love to answer your questions. Uh, let's see some other folks here. We've got Linda here as well. We've got Health Wealth Show, who's also Anthony. Um, and uh, yeah, so 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 glad to have you guys here. Um, so David also, in addition to commenting on your hat, Carl, uh, talked about there being a big influx of motivated sellers who want to get out ahead of the potential second wave of COVID. You want to talk about that at all, Carl? Sorry, I was just reading some of the other questions. Just um, ask me that one again quickly. 
Yeah, so David just made the comment. It's not really a question. Uh, he believes there's going to be a big influx of motivated sellers who want to get out ahead of the potential second wave of COVID. Yeah, so I, I totally agree with that. And I, I think we mentioned that at the start of the uh, of the call. What what I've seen a lot of times in my dealmaking career, you know, I saw it after 9-11. I saw it after the global financial crisis. I saw it after the, the recessions in the 90s that... Whilst businesses can survive and still do quite well, um, a lot of the times the sellers, they, they don't like what Adam and I call FUD, that fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to, you know, Tony Robbins again, a lot of it comes down to, um, he talks about the six human needs, like human beings all have different needs. And one of the, one of the primary needs of most human beings is certainty. They need certainty and security in their lives. You know, Maslow talked about it in, in his psychology. And for a lot of business owners who've been in that business for a long, long time, they're still doing the things they used to do, you know, back in the 80s or 90s or 70s, even when they started their business. They don't like change. They don't like having to pivot their businesses for all these different changing business models. That's why when you go and talk to most small businesses, if they're owned by baby boomers, they'll tell you they don't do any marketing. They've just got used to that repeat business and that word of mouth referrals they they're not buying facebook ads they're not leveraging google's display network they're not doing all these crazy amazing things you can do online now and um so i i do think a lot of these global macroeconomic things that are happening these global health things that are happening it's just creating that uncertainty in the mind of the seller and the natural reaction is, well, okay, I've built this business, I've made some money, it's in a good place, maybe I should just go off and do something else and let somebody else take it to the next level. And if you pick that right seller that would rather have somebody like us take it, grow it, improve it, and nurture it, rather than a trade buyer that might very well just go and destroy it just to make more money, um, you know, that's what we do. So I do, I do think this second wave, if it's gonna happen, uh, it's just going to kind of elongate the scenario that we're already in. And I think that's just deals and deals and deals. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And I think, uh, as you said, FUD is, it, it's such a motivating factor for people. And I don't think it eliminates, it doesn't eliminate everything in, in general uh, in terms of uh, uh uh, people's desire to get out or it doesn't eliminate their desire to get some level of fair value for the business. Uh, but it's a motivating force. It's, it's one that will compel people uh, to act and uh, in, impact their behaviors, right? Uh, so some, some more folks here. So glad to have you guys. We got Usman uh, and, and Steve and Jim. So, so glad you guys are here. A couple, uh, couple more questions coming in. Well, Geraldine's uh, excited because this week found a lawyer that I really can do longer term biz with, has the right mindset and outlook. He got excited when I told him the approach and then the letters uh, that she's sending out now. And that's exciting, guys. Listen, we, we've talked about it before. Building Brilliant. is critical takes investing in relationships and you can do it now you can do it remotely you can do it at any time you've got to invest in the relationships i think carl you and i should just get tattoos right across our forehead that say build a relationship exactly yeah i even had it tattooed on my sleeve oh no it's the name of my family sorry uh, oh minor details yeah. well you know you know, uh, you know, I love, that. I love that Geraldine and, you know, great job. You know, we talk about it so much because it's so important building those relationships. What drives me crazy and it makes me so freaking angry is even in our Facebook groups for our paid members in the program, occasionally you'll see somebody say, yeah, hello. Um, anybody have a contingent fee lawyer they can share with me? No. Find your own, build your own relationships. That's what you've got to do. You've got to put the time in. So Geraldine, great job um, finding somebody that, that's going to partner with you and just keep in touch with them. And, you know, that's going to be a deal partner for you for, for life. It, it's really interesting. I'll talk about this really, really briefly. I, I watched a TV show recently that's just blown my mind. Um, the Last Dance, the, the story, the Netflix story about the Chicago Bulls uh, who won six world basketball championships in the, in the 90s. And everybody talks about Michael Jordan, blah, 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 best player in the world. But 
he was only one person. He was the star of the show, but without it, without his team, his partners in that team, Dennis Rodman, Steve Kerr, Scotty Pippen, the coach, the GM of the business, they would not have won those titles. You need partners to be successful in anything that you do. So uh, great job, Geraldine. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, second everything you said and then some, right? It's, it's all about finding the right people to work with. Uh, and the only way you'll do that is if you yourself invest that time and effort into uh, finding and building those relationships. So, so really nice work. Uh, so Usman's asked, uh, hey, Adam, Carl, how would I go about finding potential off-market SaaS or software IT businesses? What sites, brokers do you recommend for on-market deals? So you got two questions there. How do you go about finding off-market deals? Off-market deals this is just a, a little roll up your sleeves and start, start, start digging, right? If you know you want IT services companies, uh, I'd start with Google. I'd start with, uh, um, you know, any of the like InfoUSA type listings and, and databases and things like that. Like there's, there's plenty of sources for those kinds of, uh, kinds of businesses. One, one of the other places as well, uh, if you're specifically interested in, in the SaaS space, um so so brokers for those types of deals you want to be going to like empire flippers uh flipper.com yep. there are a few on biz by sell but it, you know if, if you google um you know online business brokers there's like a big huge list uh you can go and see what they've got but also for off-market deals one of the ways that i've got great results is go and network inside of groups. So go and network inside of Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups for those types of businesses. So a great group for this, for the IT services space is a digital marketer. So if you, if you go to the digital marketer Facebook group, I, th I think you got to pay like $40 a year to be in the uh, DM labs or whatever it's called. And there's about 25, 30,000 people on there. And a lot of them own um, SaaS type businesses. Obviously, they're in there to grow their businesses. But I remember when I was in there, when, when I started Ninja Acquisitions, and I was learning how to do uh, direct response marketing to you know to add members to the business, clients to the business. I was learning all that stuff, and I was always blown away just how many distressed owners of technology companies were in that group. You know, they were down in the dumps, trying to grow their business, didn't know how to do it, and um, I remember people saying, oh, I just wish someone had come and, you know, take this from me and, and, and deal with it. So, so again, it's, you can network with humans, as Adam said, or you can network digitally using uh, Facebook groups and also uh, LinkedIn groups as well. And uh, Biz Buy, Sell and Flipper are my two top go-to sites for, for brokers. But be really careful in that space because a lot of the owners of those businesses, they're more entrepreneurs than they are boomers. Uh, yeah. A lot of them, they'll start a business, they'll get it to the point where they MVP it, they get past the point of critical mass, and they think, well, okay, I don't want to go through the trouble of scaling it, I'll just go sell it to somebody that's already got that infrastructure. So they can be tough deals to do as a leverage buyout. You really need somebody that's distressed, um, that wants to get out. So just a, just a cautionary word on that. Yeah, and just to follow on, right? Uh, deal triad, Carl, talk about it all the time. One of the three components of the triad is a motivated or distressed seller. Good business, distressed seller. And if they're not distressed, they're not ready to get out. It's gonna be it's gonna be a harder deal to do, uh, or you're gonna pay just that much higher of a premium for the business. And again, online businesses or SaaS businesses tend to have very little assets. Uh, so you're looking mostly at like cash flow lending and things like that which are gonna require capital injection, which goes back to the first thing we were talking about in response to Geraldine, which is build your network, build partners. So yeah, what, what, I, what I would say about the IT space is there's more angel investors in that world than in any other sector. There are gazillions of angel investors. You know, a lot of them, they work for Google and a lot of the big IT companies. So they're on all the angel investment sites. So not only are they gonna put money into your deals as your partner, they're going to be able to add a lot of value. So if you're if you buy a SaaS company and you've got a Google guy on your board of, of owners, that's a massive value add. So uh, tech's a great space for that. Yeah, absolutely. So let's see here. Uh, Jeremy made the comment. Carl uh, sounds like one deal, and you've made your uh, Tony Robbins platinum uh, platinum fee right back. So absolutely, absolutely right. 
absolutely yeah. right. I, I, I signed up for Platt as I closed a deal. Um, it was my little reward. Uh, there, you, but, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Well, well very good. So uh, let's see here. Then, um, uh, so Guy, which I believe is Geraldine, is asking, do you guys find referrals are better for for off-market deals or just cold letters and contacts. So plugging into your referral network or doing the direct approach. Referrals are always better. Referrals are always better, which again, goes back to building your network. <laughs> the bigger yeah. your network is, the more people who understand what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to do, the more people who are then available to help you. And that's just really critical. Referrals are always golden because it's a sponsored intro and it's a sponsored endorsement of you as a deal maker inside of, of that relationship and and you talk about direct approaches uh one of the things you can do with the direct approach so as you know you write a bunch of letters to people that are tailored and about one in three um you get a good response when you talk to that seller if they're not interested in selling the business to you um they might have a referral they might know somebody that's in a similar market that does potentially want to sell. And uh, you should, so you should ask for those um, when you speak to them. And again, it's all about building relationships. Yeah, couldn't, uh, couldn't agree more. So uh, Steve has asked, where can I find benchmark EBITDA figures? What do you I, have, I, have, I have an idea of what you're gonna say, but uh, where can I find benchmark EBITDA figures? So average, like average profit margins per industry? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Google. Uh, yeah, so, so Google's where I would start, one, but two, and this is what I thought you were going to say, Carl, because we, we've talked about it tangentially before, which is if you have a balance sheet only, can you figure out how big the company is from a revenue perspective, right? And so the idea is um, you can reverse engineer a lot by looking at industry standards for publicly traded companies and providing some kind of variability and range around the same industry. So... To me, that would be another hack to do that other than Googling for other documents. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. So now I understand the question. So there's a couple of things that I do. Um, so if I, if I look at a balance sheet or I have very limited information and, and I want to understand the revenues of a business, the only time you would ever do that is not to value a deal or structure a deal. It's just to make sure that it's in our ideal size range, you know, the one to 10 or ideally one to $5 million range. You want to make sure that you're looking at a business that, it's not some guy in his spare room cranking 50k a year of revenue, but then it's not some hundred million dollar subsidiary of I don't know, Boeing or IBM. So, two things that I do. Uh, the most accurate one is find out how many employees they have. So, so just to interrupt you, Carl, he was asking about how do you find benchmarks for EBITDA uh, and and not revenue. Okay, but I think where you're going is is still on the right track, right? Like you can still figure that information out by comparing to larger companies in some uh, some case, like shortcutting what you were saying, right? You get your employee count, you can figure out revenue per employee, profit per employee, and then you yeah. back that into a smaller business. Understanding infrastructure will look slightly different in a smaller business versus a bigger business, but by and large, and, and I apologize for cutting you off there, just didn't want you uh, running down the wrong road. Uh, no, no, no. I think the main point, though, is uh, to have those numbers, it's only really to, to kind of guide you in the right direction. The, the best place to get the numbers of a business is from the seller. And you can't do that until you've met them and you've built a relationship. Then if, if they like you and they want to sell you the business, they have to give you the numbers so that you can uh, value and structure the deal. Yep, absolutely. So I hope that helps, Steve. Uh, Jim's asked, what are your tips for P and C letters? I'm sending out quite a few and interested in tips for the follow-up call after they have received the letter. Yeah, so P and C I'm guessing is private and confidential. So you're sending a direct approach letter out. Um, not all of them will call you, uh, they'll call you back. Um, you might need to follow that up with, with a telephone conversation. Or um, what I sometimes do is, is I'll go to LinkedIn I'll find, I know they're on LinkedIn. I, I never write to somebody that's not at least on LinkedIn because I want to know something about them before I write to them. So I'll send them uh, an email or I'll connect to them on LinkedIn. Um, and then I, I can email them about it. Uh, if you have to call them, just call them up. Just ask to speak to the, the owner. And I actually call them by their first name. So Adam, if I was buying your business, I'd call the main number. I'd say, hey, can I speak to Adam? 
And if they say, yeah, what's it regarding? Because that's what they'll always say. I will say I, I sent some sensitive information to Steve or Adam a few days ago, and I'm following up. And they'll ask you, what's it regarding? And say, well, he wouldn't want me to talk to you about it. Because what I've always found is when you're prospecting deals, the, the, the seller or the owner will really appreciate you not sharing that stuff with, with the employees of the business because they get really anxious and they get really nervous if they think the business is going to be sold and you know what's going to become of them because they know or they've heard trade buyers buy a company and destroy it and let people go. So um, it's all about maintaining that relationship. And when you do call them, you do get through to them. Your goal on that conversation is to introduce yourself, backtrack to the letter, and then really book a time to schedule a deeper follow-up conversation. You don't want to go through it all on that call because you want some time to prepare and really drill into more information about the business so you're ready um, you know, to have that deeper follow-on conversation. You wouldn't do it straight off the bat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so... Interesting, uh, interesting question here. So Health Law Show, I believe he said his name was Anthony. He says, hi, I'm 32 years old. I've been in and out of jail for the past 10 years. I have no skills whatsoever. I bought your Dealmaker Launchpad package and I'm stuck at lesson two on which sector to actually pick. Well, first of all, Anthony, here's to, here's to your future, man. Um, here's, to you, here's to you living out the best, best years of your life for the rest of your life. Uh, you know, uh, I think I think you're taking the right steps in, in taking control of your life and, and pursuing your future. So we're excited for you. Happy you found us. We're happy to do what we can to help you get to the next step. So your question is really, hey, what industry do I buy? What kind of company do I buy? Uh, so you've been in and out of jail, so you might not have a ton of industry experience. So this is where I would do one of two different things. The first, well, actually, you can do both. The first is sit down and really evaluate what have you done in your life uh, when you weren't in jail? What kind of experiences do you ha did you have? Do, you, do your friends work in any trades? Anything you might have any kind of knowledge of and, and kind of start narrowing the process down there. If that isn't fruitful, I would start actively, actively networking, right? Very much networking. Who in your circle uh, is gainfully employed? Who in your circle has relevant experience? Say they're marketing, say they're a tradesman, they're a carpenter, a construction worker. What kind of skill sets do they have that you can then partner with and leverage to go into those sectors? So really, again, building that network. So, uh, and finding, finding people who have knowledge that you can apply to it. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I think you should have uh, a lot of traction in that way if, you, if you're aggressive and you're, and, you're working, uh, and you're working outside of circles you might have run where you were, you were you're going afoul of the law, say, previously. I think getting clear of that and focusing in on, uh, on the right steps in the right direction uh, and finding the right partners is important. Uh, but man, hats off to you. Here's to, uh, here's to your bright future. You know, we, uh, we absolutely, uh, both Carl and I, absolutely rooting for you. Uh, for sure. Awesome. Yep. Awesome. Nothing to add. Good job. So, uh, so Daisy, uh, what's the best way to play business brokers to get a good agreement? I'm assuming play means pay Daisy. Um, but, uh, I'm not really sure what you're asking there. Uh, whether, you know, as a buyer, we don't pay the business broker. Uh, if the business broker's fee is, uh, in, in, in inhibiting what we can do from a closing perspective, meaning the seller's not going to get enough of that closing payment because they're paying out a ton to the broker. You can work flexibility, flexible options of like cash flowing the fee, splitting the fee with the, with the, with the seller, you know, you can do things like that, but to play the business brokers, uh, in, uh, to get a good agreement. I don't know what that means. Um, so maybe if you can provide some clarity, we can better answer you. On yeah, that. Maybe she means how to, how to negotiate with a business broker. So, so essentially when you're making an offer on a business that a broker is selling, um, they're, they're typically going to take your offer back to the seller. Um, so you're, you're kind of negotiating with the broker and the seller at the same time. Um, and you just got to follow the process. Um, you know, you, you've got to build a relationship with the broker and the seller. Uh, you've got to get the numbers. You've got to look at, you know, what is the value of this business? How can I structure a deal that's going to be a win-win? And again, leveraging the, the deal triad that Adam talked about before. Um, 
irrespective of where the deals come from, you, you need a motivated seller of a good business. And then what you'll find is seller financing deal structures uh, tend to be a lot more amenable to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see here. So, uh, <clears throat> Robert, how can I get more detailed financial information from a seller for the finance company like AR aging reports without giving away my intention to do an LBO too soon? Uh, I think getting a AR aging is 100% is in the, the normal ask for, for me anyways. I'm going to need your recent financials. Uh, if you've got significant receivables, I want to look at your collectability. What is the actual aging? Send me your aging report. Uh, yeah, I think you're totally fine to ask that. Uh, the second element to your question, the underlying element is, so they won't know I'm doing an LBO too soon. Well, I think that just comes back to the relationship you have with the seller. I think you've got to be, as a buyer, you do have to be transparent around how you're looking to structure a deal. Exactly. You don't have to, you don't have to do it the first conversation, no, but the moment you've got uh, an understanding that the business can support an LBO, you need to start having conversations very transparently with the seller to say, listen, here's what I'm thinking. I'm going to use an accounts receivable uh, facility to fund a closing payment. And from there, using the ongoing free cash flow to pay, to pay off a seller now. You've got to have transparency because this isn't something where you're just going to slide it in at the end and, and no one will notice. They're going to notice. Their attorneys will notice. You're going to need a ton of information from them to support the facility to begin with. Um, so just be comfortable having those real conversations. Yeah, uh, and generalize it in your, in your verbiage. Generalize it in your conversation. You can just say, hey, I'm, I'm going to be raising some capital to help me buy this business. Here's what my financial partners need to be able to analyze is this a safe, use the word safe, is this a safe business and a safe deal to partner with? And, um, you know, they're going to like that. So you're well within your rights to, to have that level of information. And why it's important to start getting some of it early is because it shows you how, A, how willing they are to produce information because when you're in the due diligence part of the of, of the process, uh, you're going to need you know everything. So if if they're shy on giving you the basics at the start, it's going to tell you that it's going to be like pulling teeth. And then also, and Adam, you'll like this. Um, you know, when I start to get data from a business, it starts to tell you a lot about the quality of the business. You know, the quality of the information. Um, you know, I, I tell this story sometimes. I. I went to a business once, it was a construction company, and, and I asked the guy um, for, for the numbers, and, and he, he walked me into a back office, and he just pointed at a load of shoe boxes, and all the invoices were in one shoe box, all the uh, other documents were in another shoe box. That was his accounting system, and he had somebody coming at the end of the year and basically punch it all into um, like a Sage or a QuickBooks or what is now zero. So, um so, you know, you, you, you are absolutely well within your rights to, you know, to have that information. And, and it's interesting. Sometimes you'll talk to a broker and you'll ask them for all this information and they won't give it to you. They'll say, well, no, we're not going to give you the financials until you make an offer. And you, and you say, well, well, how can I make an offer on a business if you're not going to give me any of the numbers? It, it, it's, like, it's like a real estate agent asking you to make an offer on a house that you've never even seen. Um, so those are some of the things that you can uh, use to counter some of that negative feedback you might get. Let's see, next question here. Um, Darren Drew, how long should I wait to reach back out to an owner for financial info information? It's been four weeks since the NDA was signed and the owner told me they would gather up the information and get it back to me, but nothing yet. I'm in Pennsylvania, we're still in lockdown mode. And just today seeing some restrictions lifted, but don't know if that is playing a factor in this or not. So the first question I would ask you is, you signed that NDA four weeks ago. Have you actually had conversations with the seller in the interim? Uh, and these aren't conversations saying, hey, where's the financials? Are you still working on the relationship? Are you still working on building an understanding of how they're doing? Are they doing okay? These don't have to be long phone calls. 
these can be relatively uh, short and tight, but you're just reaching out to your touch base. If you've not been doing that, then you've not been putting that very subtle bug in their ear uh, where you're kind of top of mind, front and center that, hey, they still have something to get for you without you explicitly having to ask for it some more. So if you have been doing that and you have been having those conversations, then just ask them, hey, how are things going? Uh, where do we stand on those financial statements? We'd love to continue the, the conversation uh, and dialogue and be able to do my analysis. But you know, you've got to, you've got to, in in my opinion, just continue to build the relationship throughout that period. Yeah, nothing, nothing really to add there, Adam. I think that uh, I think you nailed it. Yeah, perfect. But, but you know, forty four weeks have gone by and they've not done what they said they would do. I would do exactly the same thing as Adam suggested. I'd call them and I'd say, hey, are you okay? Everything all right? I've not heard from you for four weeks. Um, how are you coping with the current situation? Is there anything I can do to help you? Yep. And whilst 99 times out of 100, they're going to say no. Um, it shows that you care. It shows that you want to help them. You want to be their friend. And that's going to do a lot to quickly hack a big level of rapport. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Usman's asked, would you rather would you rec would you rather recommend a brick mortar slash physical business for an LBO slash heavy finance he heavy seller finance deal? Like, uh, I don't know what our other option is. Would we rather recommend that for an LBO? Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe that's in response to online businesses. I'm not sure what the ask is. The answer is yes. Uh, an LBO is going to be far easier with a business that has real assets, both equipment uh inventory accounts receivable all the kind of assets that we like to leverage can be far easier uh in a real business absolutely uh, but i think ask a different question usman what business is in your lane what business is in your sector of understanding what businesses do you know you can add value to you have a network that you can plug in what are you passionate about um and if you want to do a deal in a sector that doesn't tick those boxes. You've got to partner with somebody that can lend that credibility to your deal. And I don't mean that in a cruel way. When, when you're buying a business, you need two different types of credibility. You need a credibility with the seller, because remember, they're going to be giving you their business. They want to make sure that you're going to be able to look after it. And then you need credibility with financiers if your deal needs a closing payment. So if you don't have the credo in the eyes of those two people, you need to partner with somebody that will and buy the business together. Because we say this every week, it's better to own 50% of a business than 100% of nothing. Yeah, couldn't agree more. That's, uh, I share that perspective for sure. Uh, and I think there's a question uh, that'll touch on that in a couple here. So Lynn is asking, if a deal falls through after due diligence, do you accrue hours, pay lawyer, accountant for that one? Uh, and the next one when you close, how often do first deals die post due diligence with first time deal makers? So uh, the broader question is how often do deals die? They die, they die in the beginning, they die in the middle, they die in the end, they die. It's just a part of the deal making journey. If you have built a real relationship with the con true contingency fee accountant and an attorney, they should not hold any of those hours against you for a future deal. Uh, it should be each deal is done independently and they're gonna ultimately rely on you and the strength of an LOI to hopefully get that through uh, to the close. However it happens. Um, yeah. So sometimes, sometimes they will ask you to roll those fees into the next deal, things like that. You just, you've gotta have a real dialogue with them around what the expectations are with them. And you have to have that dialogue before you get to that point. <laughs> well before. Yeah. And a lot of it comes down to um, you know, why has the deal aborted? Um, so there are a number of reasons why a deal can abort. You know, one reason is the seller just decides for whatever reason, they don't want to sell anymore. Um, they've changed their mind. So in your LOI, um, you always have to have uh, an abort fee, uh, which means if the seller pulls out of the transaction, um, they, there's a sum of money that they have to pay you. Um, that means you can cover any, um, any contingency fee lawyers. Um, in a lot of cases, a, a, a contingent lawyer or accountant is going to want to see that clause in the LOI before they'll agree to, to do the contingent fees. 
the, the other reasons for aborting are that uh, you've done some due diligence and the business isn't worth what you agreed to pay for it. That's why you do due diligence. And, and a lot of that then comes down to your relationship with, with the buyer and how you can leverage your deal team to communicate that. Because if, if you're finding stuff out about the business that's bad and it's affecting the price, every single buyer is going to come to the same conclusion because everybody does due diligence. And anybody that's borrowing any money whatsoever to buy a business, the buyer's uh, financier is going to do the same DD as well. So uh, so that's the case. In, in the extreme case where you do due diligence on a business and it destroys the deal completely, let's say you, dis- you find out there's a massive legal case against the business that wasn't disclosed before you made the offer. And it means, you know, you just want to pack up and run. Then in that situation, yeah, it's typical to roll the fee into the next deal, providing, of course, as Adam said, you've built that solid relationship uh, with that partner, with that advisor. So Manta Musa has asked, is the Manta database cool for origination? Are you familiar with the Manta database? Yeah, so so Man- Manta's uh, basically just an online uh, database of businesses. So um, so Manta's a global tool. Uh, you've got Doodle, you've got Info USA, you've got Hoover's. Some of them are free, like Manta. Some of them are paid. And basically, what what they do is you can go in at them and you can search. You can say, show me all the engineering businesses within fifty miles of Chicago. Uh, and you can even search on kind of revenue ranges um, and you can even search by NACE codes and, and other industry keywords. And what it's going to do is give you the start of a, of a master list of small businesses that are in your sector of choice that you can then go and approach primarily using the, the direct approach uh, letter. Alternatively, if you go to a broker and you get a, um, an information memorandum and you you get some information about the business, you can use a tool like Manta uh, to check a lot of the different things. So if there are debentures or charges against the assets, those are recorded publicly and they go into the the Manta uh, database. Um, You can, you can check the ownership structure. So sometimes on a broker deal, uh, they'll just tell you the name of the business. They won't tell you who owns it, who owns what percentage, What's the legal structure? Is it an S corp, a C corp, an LLC? It's in the UK. Is it a limited company? Is it an LLP? Is it a partnership? Is it a sole trader? Manta gives you a lot of that kind of insight, um, which you know, is valuable information about whether or not you want to pursue the deal. But they're all great free tools. If you're in the demo, if you're in DealMaker CEO, there's links and demos of, of how to how to use all that stuff. Absolutely. HK, uh, HK has asked, isn't it dangerous to rely on historical financials in this environment? The demand curve has changed. Low touch economy might be here to stay. Best way to think due diligence and valuation. So historical financials, yes, have to be de-weighted a little bit. But the first thing I would do is you got to have year to date numbers. Here we are. It's June 5th. At a minimum, you should have through April. And April at this point will have a month and a half of COVID impacts, meaning Corona really picked up in mid-March. So April is a full month where that business would have been impacted. But more than just the numbers, now here in June, you have an understanding of what's truly happened in two and a half months. Because whether the financials are out or not, you know the owner will know how that business has fared and how they did. It's just a matter of you actually having the conversation. How did it go? What happened to your customer? Were jobs delayed that you had already secured? Were jobs accelerated? Uh, what happened? How did you pivot? How did you not pivot? How did you market? How did you stop marketing? All of those things factor into that. Uh, and again, for us, typically the types of businesses we're most interested in are ones that are relatively insulated from that kind of retail nature uh, that was pretty heavily impacted by COVID. We tend not to focus on restaurants. We tend not to focus on uh, retail retail stores and hospitality. We just we tend not to. We're generally okay 
evaluating companies that support those industries, but not necessarily the end businesses themselves. Like I would, I'd definitely be open to a, a, you know, a food distributor per se, because their risk is diversified across a broader pool of people. Uh, and a lot of their costs are very variable based on volume. So, so again, to me, it, it all depends on the business and, and what they do, but, uh, but, you know, in terms of due diligence, uh, to me, that then comes down to, to deal structure. Due, due diligence is really verifying backlogs, verifying contracts, verifying customers and things like that. Um, you know, I think most importantly is less about the due diligence because that's legitimate. Some of it's unproven, but deal structure is where you mitigate your risk here. I'm going to pay you less guaranteed for the business and increase your upside through earnouts or things like that. That's only paid based on performance. You still get to make as much or more of the money that you might want if the business continues to be successful, you being the seller, and then you as the buyer, you get to de-risk the deal by putting a bigger emphasis uh, of risk on the seller through the earn out. Yep. And something you said in that, Adam, I think it's a really, really valuable point. When you talked about you know, a food distribution business versus a restaurant, you know, it, it, like restaurants, unless they're pivoting to uh take out restaurants are struggling right now but the food distribution industry is actually growing because food distribution companies not only distribute to restaurants and hotels which are struggling but they distribute to grocery stores and as we know the net spending grocery stores year on year is significantly higher a because most people they're obviously eating in a lot more now than, than they used to. Uh, but B, um, you know, when people get fearful of, of what's happening, they buy more stuff than they actually need, you know, panic buying. Um, so, you know, I'd love to own a food distribution business. Um, I think those guys are going to, those guys win either way. Um, yeah, we just looked, we just looked at a great one uh, yesterday in the uh, Dealmaker Academy, uh, the Red Light, Green Light call uh great great looking business uh it was in it was in uh our head our head coach john's uh it was in his hall of fame Uh, so so definitely a good one um okay here so uh next is jacques uh if a seller retains 20 percent equity and is willing to stay on and manage the business for two years from his perspective is it reasonable for the buyer to use 100 percent of the business profits to fund the vendor loan Absolutely. Of course it is. Absolutely. And there's great, ways, what a great deal. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, right? Like there's ways you can protect their interest, right? So it's like, um, hey, we'll use the cash flow and the assets to pick up the loan. Um, and we'll give you a preferential profit share for the first X dollars uh, of, of, of free cash flow that you can take uh, in acceleration uh, of us getting it. Uh, to compensate you for the risk and you owning 20% of the business. But the reality is, listen, use whatever tools you can to close the deal, set up the deal structure in a way that everyone's happy with. Um, you know, I don't see there's any reason, uh, even when you're buying less than 100%, to use the core assets of the business to then pay for what you're buying. At the end of the day, right, you're buying a business. You're not going to just say, hey, here's a million dollars. I bought this business. And I'm not expecting that business to then pay me back for the million dollars. That's an all cash transaction. When you're using financing, it's the same thing. You want the business to pay for the acquisition. That's the point of doing it. It's how you just wisely use leverage. So yeah, absolutely, totally cool uh, in my book as well. Uh, Let's see. Uh, I do have to say, uh, you guys are an awesome group of people. Mark and Faith and a few others have, have shouted out to Anthony. Uh, Anthony, really, guys, we're looking forward. We're looking forward to your future success, man. So uh, glad you're getting on the right track. Uh, so and to everyone who's kind of well wished him, uh, nice work. Uh, Mark's even given him a suggestion for a specific support group he can look into. So, so you guys are just absolutely awesome. Okay, so. Daisy, she was asking previously, what do we do with a, um, uh, with a broker uh, negotiation? Uh, she, she was talking about negotiating with the broker on how to pay them. Uh, as a buyer, you don't need to negotiate with brokers uh, unless in the situation where you want to cash flow their payment out of the business instead of the seller being fully responsible, 
so the seller can keep more money at the point of closing. And the conversation is really simple. Hey, broker, how much money are you going to make and what's your fee structure from this deal? Normally they'll say, ah, I'm making 5% of the transaction. I'm making 8% of the transaction. I'm making 10% of the transaction. Whatever that is, if it's a $2 million deal and they're making 10% of the transaction, they're looking forward to $200,000 at the point of transaction. You can go to them, and this is one strategy potentially, and you say, listen, broker, I'm only making a $500,000 closing payment uh, between paying off 100 grand of debt and your quarter million dollar fee or your $200,000 fee. The, the seller's only going to walk away with $200,000 at the point of closing. That doesn't feel good. They're not happy with it. They want a lot more money. Would you be open to, instead of me paying you $200,000, would you be comfortable if I paid you 250,000, so you make 50 grand more, if we spread it out over two years, so each year you'll make 125,000 paid monthly. And on top of that, I call the seller and I say, hey seller, what if you cut your fees by $75,000? Here's what I'll do. I'll split with you 50-50, the renegotiated fees. You're going to pay 125,000 spread over two years. You get to cash flow it. We can even offset your seller seller financing with that, because uh, from our perspective, we got to pay it anyways. So cool, sellers cover that half, and then for us, we just build into our cash flow projection. We've got a cash flow over two years, 125,000, so roughly five grand or so a month. That's not a big big ask in that particular deal, because the company you're buying for two million dollars or that, that, that's worth $2 million and you're putting 500 K down, you've got, you've got plenty of, uh, you've got plenty of, of margin there, uh, likely in the, the, the cash flow. Nice. So, not, hopefully not we answer that Daisy. Nice deal, Adam. You're not your first rodeo. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's always ways to work it, right? When you're working on a broker deal, remember there's three parties, there's you, the seller and the broker. All three have to walk away feeling like they've won. If they don't, it's a deal not worth doing. Simple as that. Let's see here. Alex has said, I saw in a recent video that we said when doing a 12 month cash flow forecast, it can be okay to look at it from a macro level. When you say this, do you mean it's okay to do the following? Invoices paid to customers each month equal years revenue divided by 12. Invoices paid to suppliers each month equal years cost of goods divided by 12. Is this okay or does it need to be exact? Each month's cash flow due to seasonality. Um, it's a little I can bit. That. Yeah, yeah I, I can answer that. So, so th there's two parts to this. So, so first off, when when you're valuing the business in the first instance, just to give you a general steer, you you want to take one month's worth of revenue as the minimum amount of cash that you need to be in that business before you make the offer. Then later on in the deal, what you then want to do is, to your point you want to calculate a forward 12 month cash flow forecast so you can understand what the seasonality of the business is and then ultimately what's the minimum amount of cash flow the business needs throughout that year to be ordered to trade safely because obviously if you've got months where you know if you're buying an ice cream business it's going to gush cash flow in the summer but then obviously it's going to eat cash in the winter because you've still got overhead but you've got no revenue coming in. So you've got to balance the two out. Um, there's actually a template for this in, uh, in DealMaker CEO. It's the one that we use on uh, even on our prox deals. And, and it's really, it, it's looking from a cash perspective, you know, what cash is coming into the business and then what cash is going out. So it's your revenues coming in, less your cost of sales, um, how quickly you're paying your suppliers, you know, tax payments, rent payments, utility payments, any other vendors, your employees, all those different things. And you do it on a month by month basis. Uh, so I, I wouldn't attempt to do it from scratch. Um, you could hire a CPA that will probably charge you $5,000. Uh, or if you're in the DealMaker CEO program, um, go to module number 10, um, it is in there. You just download that sheet plug in your numbers and it calculates it all for you in about five minutes. Yeah, you nailed it, Carl. Absolutely nailed it. So um, uh, let's see here. Uh, 
Um, trying to work through the questions. Thanks, thanks all for, for providing some today. I really appreciate it. Um, and again, to the support for Anthony kind of kicking off his life, we, we definitely appreciate that uh, from you guys as well. This is a great community. Um, let's see, Geraldine said uh, uh, she loves that. The way they're about providing data will tell you the quality of the business, talking about seller. Reminds me of the phrase, the way you do anything is the way you do everything, so choose that business wisely. So if you're working on a seller relationship, realize that, uh, you know, you want to be building it and continue to work with it. Uh, and you'll expect from the reciprocity how that transaction will ultimately go. Yep. Uh, so Nelson's got a question here. Uh, thoughts on a business under a million with a good net and employees. Any reason not to consider it? Thanks. Uh, I'll never not consider it uh, in the sense that I'm going to at least do a little bit more digging to, to understand cool. how it really works, right? Remember, Carl and I have three killer seller questions, right? The first is, why are they selling? Got to know that. The second is, what is their corporate structure? Who's actually running and doing what in the business? This is ultimately you backing into, is there an existing general manager in that business that you can put in charge so you don't have to work on the day to day? And then the third is, how do you make money? What are you doing to generate revenue? How are you closing sales? What's your sales cycle? All of that stuff. Between those three questions, you're going to know exactly uh, whether a business sub $1 million has the infrastructure, the talent, and the skill sets in place to actually continue to operate and grow post-transition. Yeah, so that's a really good point. So so for me, when, when we talk about the, the kind of one to five, one to 10 million range, uh, you know, we all know why we don't go typically above 10 million because you've got a lot more competition for those deals. But when, when you go below a million, you've got to be really careful for two things. First, you've got to make sure that you're just not buying a one man entity. You know, I was looking at a PR business this morning uh, that's sub a million pounds, very, very profitable, like 35% margins, but it's a one man company. So, really, if you buy it, you're just buying a job. Uh, because it's got no infrastructure, it's got no management team. The business will not work without that person involved. And with really, really small deals and really small businesses, the owner is so intrinsically tied to that customer base. If that seller suddenly walks away, often a lot of the customers do as well for really small deals. So, and then the other thing you got to be careful of is when you're doing a really, really small deal, is the juice worth the squeeze, right? So, <laughs> is it going to generate you? Steal my line, huh? Steal your line, buddy. Uh, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is it going to generate the cash flow uh, that you typically need to make it worthwhile? Because what I'll tell you is it takes the same amount of time to buy a $5 million business than it does to buy a $500,000 business. And it's actually easier to buy a $5 million business because um, you're going to have a lot more solid data. There's going to be a lot more things in the business that work without the seller being there. The only time I would look at buying really small kind of micro businesses is if you were going to do a roll up and a roll up is where you pick a niche, like a coffee shop, for example, it, you would be crazy to go and buy just one coffee shop. The average coffee shop makes about 40,000 a year in profit. And that's what the owner takes home and they're probably working 60, 70 hours a week. So you'd never buy that type of business, but if you went and bought 10 of them and you rolled them all up and combined them, there are tons and tons of synergies that you will get um, by doing that. You will pay a lot less for milk, a lot less for coffee, a lot less for cups. You can strip out all of the costs each location will have, like insurance, like HR, marketing, advertising, um, the cost of a CPA, and that all goes centrally into one company. So the profit in each of those businesses becomes massively higher. So that's the way to, to generate good cash flow from, from small businesses. You've got to buy a lot of them and combine them. You nailed it, Carl. Per usual, nailed it. Uh, let's see here. Um, so thanks, Nelson, for that question. Uh, Mirza has asked, what's the difference between your older course and this new one? Uh, so Dealmaker CEO is, uh, is, is very much uh, the same as Business Buying Accelerator. It's just under our new, new branding. Uh, so those are the same. It's the comprehensive toolkit that you will, you have everything in there 
that you could possibly need if you've never bought a business to go out and buy a business and to do it 99 days or less. Um, yep. You know, you've got to hustle, you've got to put in the work, but you've got everything at your disposal. Um, super exciting. Uh, just makes me think um, uh, earlier this week, I had the opportunity to talk to a, a dealmaker CEO student. Uh, awesome, awesome situation. Uh, his deal closes on June 15th. So he's 10 days away now from closing his deal. Super exciting. Uh, great situation. I mean, phenomenal deal. Just shows the power of relationships. I can't give you any more. Uh, no. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Can't give what you guys any more. deal. What a deal that is. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah, it's a crazy situation. This guy's set up for success. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, better yet, putting none of his own money in it, and he's not running the business day to day. Just a phenomenal situation. So, Good luck to him to close here in 10 days. Um, so super excited. Um, Jeremy is asking a question about partnering. If you're going outside your sector, I assume it is also important to find someone that complements your skills, correct? Absolutely, Jeremy. Uh, I mean, that's, yes. Uh, if you're going into a sector and you're gonna partner, find someone who knows that sector. It's, yeah, about as uh, straightforward as, uh, as I can get. Pretty clean answer there. Um, we'll get, we'll get to, uh, we'll get, just get to one or uh, two more questions guys. And then we're, uh, we've got a jet. This has been an awesome Friday session. Uh, so I'm just going to skip down. Uh, Uvis has asked thoughts on consolidating construction companies. I've got three sellers. Uh, my thoughts are really simple. Do it. <laughs> go buy those companies. Uh, absolutely go buy those companies. Uh, and then for anyone else, uh, uh, I'll get one more question in here. Uh, for anyone else who's, uh, who's looking to get into acquisitions and hasn't done anything yet, uh, we just want to encourage you guys to continue pursuing your dream and taking action. If you don't know what it looks like to go buy a business and you haven't before, check out Carl Allen's Business Buying Blueprint. It is totally, totally free. Uh, we'll drop a link in the chat. Super simple. Just download it, put in your email, and we'll send it to you. Um, you know, we want to get you guys started on your journey and we want you guys to be action takers. That's what a deal maker is. They are action takers. So guys, looking forward to, uh, to you getting your copy of that. All right, so um, uh, lots of people are here connecting in the chat, which is absolutely, absolutely great, of course. Um, and I have to shout out Faith here. Faith has been doing a, a great job answering uh, Athenial's question around uh, how will the overall COVID situation and, uh, and the overall uh, unsettlement here in the U.S. with riots and otherwise, how will that affect business owners who might be looking to sell? Faith's done an awesome heavy lift here, and so thanks, Faith. But, but ultimately, what Faith has said is exactly what we were talking about earlier today. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt will ultimately drive sellers to the market, and when they're in the market, they're highly motivated. It presents opportunities for you to negotiate a, uh, a good deal where everyone can walk away a winner. So Faith, thanks for that. And guys, we certainly hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. I'm looking forward to my weekend. Uh, I'm hopefully gonna get it started here soon. Uh, but guys, have a great weekend. Remember you're one deal away from changing your life. So you've gotta take action to achieve that mark. Really looking forward to it. Carl? Great. Thanks, Adam. Have a great weekend, everybody. Keep, uh, keep cranking on those deals and uh, we'll see you guys soon. See you guys. Bye for now.